Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're covering light and optics for MCAT physics. In this chapter, we're going to cover a couple of objectives. The first objective we're going to cover is the electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to discuss electromagnetic waves, the full spectrum, and also talk about color and the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Next, we'll discuss geometric geometrical optics. This objective is pretty dense. We're going to cover reflection, refraction, and lenses. Third, we'll talk about diffraction. We're going to cover diffraction of light for a single slit, for a slit lens system, and finally for multiple slits. And then last but not least, we're going to cover polarization. We're going to define plane polarized light as well as circular polarization. Let's go ahead and get started with our first objective. And that first objective is the electromagnetic spectrum. Now the full electromagnetic spectrum ranges from radio waves, all right, from radio waves down here, all the way, all right, to gamma rays. And so this this electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves on one end, these are long wavelength, low frequency, low energy waves to gamma rays on the other end. All right, short waves, high frequency, high energy. All right, and so that's important to remember from one end of the electromagnetic range. All right, we have radio waves here, which can be described as having long wavelength, low frequency and low energy all the way to the other end where we see gamma rays and on this end we see short wavelengths all right we see high frequency and we see high energy now in ascending order of energy the spectrum is going to include radio waves all right followed by microwaves followed by infrared followed by visible then ultraviolet, then x-rays, and then finally gamma rays. All right, this chapter though primarily focuses on this visible spectrum. All right, the visible spectrum of light. This is gonna correspond to wavelengths that range from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. All right, now electromagnetic waves, these are created through the reciprocal relationship between electric and magnetic fields. So a changing magnetic field, what is it going to do? It's going to induce a changing electric field and vice versa. These waves, they're transverse, meaning the oscillating electric and magnetic fields are going to be perpendicular, perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Now in vacuum, all electromagnetic waves, they travel at the speed of light at approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. All right. This speed also closely approximates their, their travel speed in air. Now, something that's also important here for us to talk about is the relationship between wave speed, frequency, and wavelength. Now, we covered these in the last chapter, but I want to redefine. Wavelength, that's the distance between identical points on a consecutive wave. So it could be from crest to crest, all right? That you can determine the wavelength that way, or from trough to trough. Now, frequency is the number of waves that pass a point per unit of time, all right? And there's a relationship between frequency and wavelength and also um, speed, wave speed. And that's that wave speed is equal to frequency times wavelength all right c here is the speed of light in vacuum which we said is three times 10 to the eight meters per second to be more precise it's 2.98 times 10 um, to the eight meters per second all right fantastic now the full electromagnetic spectrum like we said is broken into various regions all right, we talked about radio, microwave, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays. It's important to understand the full spectrum and its divisions. Of course, we're going to be hyper-focused on the visible range, again, from 400 to 700 nanometers. The visible region of the spectrum is the only part that human eye perceives as light. 
So within this region, different wavelengths are going to correspond to different colors, with violet being at the 400 nanometer region. And if you go all the way to the end, near the end of the visible region at around 700 nanometers, we see red here, all right? Light containing all colors in equal intensity, that's going to appear white. The color of an object is determined by the light it reflects. So an object appearing red is going to absorb all light except red light, all right? So that's an important thing to also keep in mind. As well as this relationship, this formula is a very important one for you to remember for the MCAT. All right, so that's our introduction to the electromagnetic spectrum. With that, we can move into our second objective here on geometrical optics. All right, again, this objective is dense, but it contains a lot of important information that you can be tested on. All right, so definitely pay attention to the content we cover here. All right, to set this objective up, all right, let's recall that when light travels through a homogeneous medium, it travels in a straight line. This is known as the rectilinear propagation. Now, the behavior of, life, uh, of light at the boundary of a medium or interface between two media is described by the theory of geometrical optics. Geometrical optics explains reflection and refraction as well as the applications of mirrors and lenses. And so we're going to cover all of those topics in this objective. We're going to start off by first covering reflection. All right. Reflection is the rebounding of incident light waves at the boundary of a medium. All right. So unlike transmission where light passes through in reflection, light waves rebound off the boundary and retreat back into the originating medium. All right, the phenomenon, this phenomenon of reflection on a flat surface like a plane wave is shown here in this figure where we have an incident ray coming in, all right, and there's some reflected ray. All right, so to repeat, reflection is the rebounding of incident light waves at the boundary of a medium. All right, light waves that are reflected are not absorbed into the second medium, rather they bounce off the boundary and then travel back through the first medium. All right, kind of like what we're seeing in this depiction right here. Now the law of reflection can be written, all right, in this expression right here. All right, so the law of reflection says that theta one equals theta two, where theta one is the incident angle all right, and theta 2 is the reflected angle, both measured from the normal. And the normal is a line drawn perpendicular to the boundary of the medium. All right, all angles in optics are measured from the normal, not the surface of the medium. All right, so we're going to repeat this term a lot when we're discussing further lens and mirrors and whatnot. So let me define it one more time. The normal is a line drawn perpendicular to the boundary of a medium. All right. And you see that here in our depiction. All right. So again, the law of reflection says that theta one, all right, this angle right here is equal to theta two. All right. Now, keeping that in mind, we can start to talk about plane mirrors. All right. In general, mirrors are going to produce images that can be classified as real or virtual. A real image is formed when light rays physically converge at the images at, at the image's location. All right. A real image is formed when light rays physically converge all right, at the image's location, at the position of the image. In contrast, virtual image gives the illusion of light emanating from its position without any real convergence. All right, one of the distinguishing features of real images is the ability of the image to be projected onto a screen. All right, so that's the distinction between real and virtual images. Images created by a mirror can be real or virtual, and we discuss their relative definitions. Now, a parallel incident light ray remain parallel after reflection from a plane mirror. That is, plane mirrors being flat reflective surfaces cause neither convergence 
nor divergence of reflected light rays. Because the light does not converge at all, plane mirrors always create virtual images. All right? Always create virtual images. In, play, in a plane mirror, the image appears to be the same distance behind the mirror as the object is in front of it. All right? Let me repeat that because that's, that's important. In plane mirror, the image appears to be the same distance behind the mirror as the object in front of it. So if we have a mirror right here, let's pretend this is a mirror, all right? And we have an object right here, it's gonna appear as a virtual image in the mirror that seems to be the same distance, all right, behind the mirror as the object does in front of it, all right? In other words, plane mirrors create the appearance of light rays originating behind the mirrored surface. Because the reflected uh, light remains in front of the mirror, but the image appears behind the mirror, the image is virtual, all right? Plane mirrors include most of the common mirrors that are found in our homes, all right? Plane mirrors can be conceptualized as spherical mirrors with an infinite radius of curvature. All right, so I just made mention of something else here, spherical mirrors. Plane mirrors can be conceptualized as spherical mirrors with an infinite radius of curvature. What does any of that mean? Well, it's a great segue into discussing what spherical mirrors are so that statement can make just a little more sense. All right, spherical mirrors, they come in two types. They come in concave and convex, all right? As the term suggests, these mirrors resemble fragments of a larger spherical surface. So these mirrors, they have an intrinsic center of curvature, all right, which we denote as C, and a radius of curvature, which we'll see as lowercase r. The center of curvature, it lies on the optical axis equidistant from the mirror's vertex as the radius of curvature. It would denote the center if the mirror were a full sphere. All right. So like we said, we have two types of spher spherical mirrors, concave and convex. All right. The word spherical implies that the mirror can be considered a spherical cap or dome taken from a much larger spherically shaped mirror, all right? Now, if we were to look from the inside of a sphere to its surface, we would see a concave surface. On the other hand, if we were to look from the outside of the sphere, we would see a convex surface. For a concave surface, the center of curvature and the radius of cur cur uh, curvature are located in front of the mirror. But for a convex surface, the center of curvature and the radius of curvature are behind the mirror. Concave mirrors are called converging mirrors and convex mirrors are called diverging mirrors because they cause parallel incident light rays to converge and diverge after they reflect respectively, all right? Now, that's a lot of definition and a lot of verbiage. Let's make more sense of it, all right? There are several important lengths that are associated with mirrors. They're shown here in this figure, all right? So we're gonna go through each of them. The focal length, F, all right, here, this, this curvy F, all right? The focal length F is the distance between the focal point, capital F, and the mirror. So here's the mirror right here, all right? This F, the focal length, is the distance between the focal point and the mirror. Note that for all spherical mirrors, F is equal to R over 2, where R is the radius of curvature, all right? Where R is the radius of curvature. So F equals R over 2, where the radius of curvature R is the distance between, what is R? The distance between C and the mirror, all right? So that is what R is. It's the distance between C and the mirror. 
Now the distance between the object and the mirror, that's denoted with an O. So if we place our object right here, the distance from the object to the mirror is denoted with a lowercase O. All right, the distance between the image and the mirror, that is I, lowercase i. So if we get an image that's right here from the mirror, and here's the mirror, the distance between image and mirror is denoted lowercase i. All right, so these are all terms and, and, and notes that you should know. I'm going to repeat these one more time. All right, c is the center of curvature. All right, that's what C is, center of curvature, right here. All right, the focal length, lowercase f, is the distance between the focal point, which is capital F, and the mirror. All right, and remember, for all spherical mirrors, f equals r over 2, where the radius of curvature is just the distance between C, the center of curvature, and the mirror. All right, that's lowercase r. Okay, the distance between the object and the mirror is O, and the distance between the image and the mirror is I. All right, lowercase. And there is also a simple relationship between these four differences, uh, these distances. And we can write it through this expression right here. One over the focal length, remember the distance between focal point and mirror, is equal to one over O, O is the distance between object and the mirror plus 1 over I, where I is the distance between the image and the mirror. And that is also equal to 2 over R, where R is the radius of convergence. So there is a clear relationship between these four different distances. All right. While it is not important which units of distance are used in this equation, it's really just important that all the values used have the same units as each other. All right, now on the MCAT, you will most often use this equation to calculate the image distance for all types of mirrors and lenses. All right, so it's gonna be important that we understand a couple of things then, all right? If the image has a positive distance, all right? So if I is greater than zero, all right, if the image has a positive distance, I is greater than zero, it is a real image, which implies that the image is in front of the mirror. But if the image has a negative distance, so I is less than zero, all right, then it's a virtual image and it's located behind the mirror. Plane mirrors can be thought of as spherical mirrors with infinitely large focal distances. And so as such, for a plane mirror, all right, for a plane mirror, R equals F, which equals infinity. And the equation simplifies, and it becomes 1 over O plus 1 over I is equal to 0. Or in other words, I equals minus O. This can be pretty much interpreted as saying the virtual image is at some distance behind the mirror equal to the distance the object is in front of the mirror. All right. So these are some important things to keep in mind. All right. That will help you understand this equation, this simple relationship between these four different uh, distances. Now, magnification is also something that you can be asked to calculate or can be asked a conceptual question on. All right, magnification is a dimensionless value that is the ratio of the image distance to the object distance. So magnification equals minus i. Remember, i is the distance between the image and the mirror over o, and o is the distance between object and the mirror. So by extension, the magnification also gives the ratio of the size of the image to the size of the object, all right? And the orientation of the image, whether it's upright or inverted, can be determined, all right, by looking at what kind of sign you get from the magnification. So for example, a negative magnification, a minus M value, signifies an inverted image, while a positive value plus M signifies an upright image. Now, if the absolute value of M is less than one, all right, if the absolute value of magnification is less than one, then the image is smaller than the object. All right, so it seems reduced in size. 
But if the absolute value of m is greater than 1, then the image is larger than the object. All right, it seems enlarged. And of course, if the absolute value of m equals 1 exactly, the image is the same size as the object. All right. Now, something else that's important for us to discuss are ray diagrams. All right. Ray diagrams. So here I actually show the ray diagrams for a concave spherical mirror with the object at three different positions. All right. This one has an object right here, all right? And then we have an object that's right here, all right? And an object that's right here, okay? So we show ray diagrams for a concave spherical mirror with the object at three different points. A ray diagram is useful for getting an approximation of where an image is. So on test day, when you're taking the MCAT, it could be useful sometimes when you're conceptualizing the problem when you're conceptualizing an optics problem, that ray diagrams can be helpful for a quick determination of the type of image that will be produced by an object some distance from the mirror. All right, and that'll help you determine whether it's real versus virtual, inverted versus upright, or magnified versus reduced. Now, when you're drawing a ray diagram, there are three important rays to draw. So for a concave mirror, a ray that strikes the mirror parallel to the axis is reflected back through the focal point. So that's an important thing to remember. Let me repeat that. A ray that strikes the mirror parallel to the axis, all right, so the normal passing through the center of the mirror is reflected back through the focal point. These are the green lines here in figure A and figure B. All right, now a ray that passes a ray that passes through the focal point before reaching the mirror is reflected back parallel to the axis. You see that in the red lines drawn here. All right. And a ray that strikes the mirror at the point of intersection with the axis is reflected back with the same angle measured from the normal. Those are the blue lines. All right. Now that's a lot of words. So let's look at each of these ray diagrams and let's talk about them all right so in the first figure here a all right the object the object is right here it's placed behind the focal point all right the object is placed behind the focal point and the image produced is going to be real inverted and magnified all right, you can see that the object is placed here. And like we talked about, a, a ray that strikes the mirror parallel to the axis like this does. All right, it's going to be reflected back and it's going to go through the focal point. All right. In addition, a ray that passes through the focal point before reaching the mirror, all right, is going to be reflected is going to be reflected back parallel to the axis. All right. And so we can see that here. This li red line should go through the focal point, touch the mirror, and then go back this way. I'm going to draw it better with the red line. This red line should touch the focal point, all right, to hit the mirror, and then go back parallel to the axis. And this point of intersection is where we get the image. And that's how we determine here really quickly from the ray diagram, all right, that the image produced is real, right? It's not behind the mirror. It's in front of the mirror. So it's real. It's inverted, all right, because it's below this axis, all right? And it's magnified, all right? Now in figure B, all right, in figure B, the object is placed at the focal point. All right, and no image is formed because the reflected light rays are going to be just parallel to each other. All right, so you have a ray from the object hitting parallel the mirror, and then that's going to be reflected through the focal point. All right, and then because it's placed at the focal point, all right, there's no there's no focal. It's just going to hit the mirror and then hit back parallel to that. And so both of these lines are parallel to each other. So no image is produced, all right? And when the image is placed bet between the focal point and the mirror, 
all right? So before the focal point, if you will, all right, we get the diagram C here, all right? So for this figure, the object is placed between F and the mirror, and the image produced, as you'll notice, is virtual, upright, and magnified, all right? So we can draw our parallel line here, so we can draw... Um, for a concave mirror, a ray that strikes the mirror pal a parallel to the axis, all right? And then that's going to be um, reflected back through the focal point, which is what we draw here in this green line, all right? And then we have the object also hitting the red line, right? This is a ray that passes through the focal point before reaching the mirror. It's reflected back parallel to the axis. So it can go through here, and it hits the focal point. All right, and the image you get is virtual, right? It's behind the mirror. It's upright, okay? And it's magnified. Now, sometimes ray diagrams are hard for people to understand or visualize, and that's okay because we can kind of talk about sign conventions for a single mirror also. And we're actually going to look at that, but let's also just discuss ray diagrams for converging uh, for a convex or diverging mirror. So this is a convex ray diagram. A single diverging mirror forms only a virtual upright and reduced image regardless of the position of the object. The further away the object, the smaller the image will be. All right. To quickly remember that, recall the following sign conventions here as well. So I really like this table because it's going to summarize everything that we saw with the ray diagrams visually, but it's just going to help you keep in mind important things in case ray diagrams don't make all that much sense. All right. So here we're talking about our symbols O, I, R, F, M. Okay. Remember what each of these stand for. So O, that's the distance between the object and the mirror. I is the distance between the image and the mirror. R is your radius of curvature. F is your focal length. And M is your magnification. If O is positive, the object is in front of the mirror. But if O is negative, the object is behind the mirror. All right. I, if I is positive, the image is in front of the mirror and it's real. And if I is negative, the image is behind the mirror, it's virtual. All right, R, your radius of curvature. If it's positive, the mirror is concave or converging. And if it's negative, then the mirror is convex and diverging. All right, F, your focal length. If it's positive, the mirror is concave. And if it is negative, it is convex. And last but not least, all right, your magnification. If it's positive, the image is upright or erect. And if it is negative, then the image is inverted. All right, let's take all of this information and put it into effect by tackling a practice problem. This problem says an object is placed seven centimeters in front of a concave mirror that has a 10 centimeter radius of curvature. Determine the image distance, the magnification, whether the image is real or virtual, and whether it is inverted or upright. So to kind of tackle this problem, we're of course going to use our equation that relates all of these relationships, all of these variables together, where 1 over f, 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over o plus 1 over i, and that's equal to 2 over r. All right, we're given some information here. All right, we're given some information. Um, we said an object is placed seven centimeters in front of a concave mirror that has a 10 centimeter radius of curvature. All right, so R is 10 centimeters. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and we have an object is placed seven centimeters in front, all right, of a concave mirror. So the object is placed seven centimeters in front of the concave mirror. All right, determine the image distance the magnification and whether the image is real or virtual and inverted or upright. So we have R and we have O. So we can tackle this part of the equation right here because the only we can use the R and O to figure out I. All right, so I, o, 1 over O plus 1 over I is equal to 2 over R. All right, and we're trying to solve for I, so we're going to move 
this to the other side. And now we have 1 over i is equal to 2 over r minus 1 over o. Okay, now we can start to, to, to plug in things. All right, 1 over i is equal to 2 over 10 centimeters, right? Because we were given the radius of curvature to be 10 centimeters, minus 1 over 7, 7 centimeters. That's the, the distance that the object is placed in front of the mirror. All right, and now to do this, we're just going to, you know, if we're trying to do this by hand without a calculator, we want them to have a common denominator. And so we can say that the common denominator here is 70. So this is times 7 and this is times 7. So 2 over 10 is equal to 14 over 70. All right, and this is equal to 1 over 7 is equal to 10 over 70. So now we have 14 minus 10. All right, that's equal to 4 over 70. All right, so now we have 1 over i is equal to 4 over 70. And then we can do the inverse of both of these so that i is equal to 70 over 4, which is about 17.5 centimeters. All right, 17.5 centimeters. A positive value for i, all right, here's i. A positive value means that the image is in front of the mirror and it is therefore real, all right? Now, for a single lens or mirror where O is greater than zero, all right, a real image will, be, will, will always be inverted. All right, so we have a lot of information here. Let's write some conclusions. This is our I value. It's positive. It signifies that the image, all right, that the image is in front of the mirror. All right, image is in front of mirror. Okay, and therefore it is real. For a single lens or mirror where zero, where, where O is greater than zero, which is the case here, all right, O is seven centimeters, a real image will always be inverted. All right, a real image will always be inverted. Okay, fantastic. Now, the magnification, we also have to figure out the magnification. So M is equal to minus I over O, okay? We have both of these values now, so this is minus 17.5 centimeters over 10, uh, over seven centimeters, I'm sorry, O is seven, over seven centimeters. This gives us about minus 2.5. The negative sign on the magnification, it confirms that the image is inverted. Okay, so that's, this is what really helps us confirm whether the image is inverted or not. The magnification here is negative, and so the image is inverted. And the fact that the absolute value of the magnification, all right, Absolute value of minus 2.5 is 2.5, which is greater than 1, indicates what? It indicates that the image is enlarged. All right, so the image is enlarged. So we can use, these, we, we can use this equation to figure out all the variables. And then having all the variables, we can determine whether, you know, if they're positive or negative, what that means in relation to the image distance, the object distance, whether it's real or virtual, inverted or upright. All right? So that's why it's really important to make sure you know this equation and you understand the relationship between these variables. All right? And what a negative and positive sign for each of these variables means. All right, with that, I'm going to end the video here. In the next video, we'll continue objective two. All right, starting with discussing refraction and hopefully continuing the rest of the chapter. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.